Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah. Salatu wassalamu ala Rasulullah. So, um, it's wonderful to be here in, uh, in Baltimore, alhamdulillah, to speak about this topic. Um, I have an unusual law practice in that I do a lot of estate planning for Muslims, uh, for people within the Muslim community, based on the Islamic rules of inheritance. And I also do estate litigation that involves inheritance disputes um, between family members. And so what typically happens is that an individual dies and brothers and sisters will typically sue each other in inheritance disputes. And so several years ago, I was in court in Los Angeles, and I was waiting in line. And when you wait in line in court, there are several different cases that are being heard before your case gets an opportunity to be heard. And I heard this one case where there were about seven or eight lawyers, and they were arguing um, over a really small issue but it was a really big case. It was an enormous case. It was worth hundreds of millions of dollars. And it occurred to me that I actually knew the person who had passed away. I had been to his janazah. I knew him personally. It was a wonderful family. Just a wonderful family. Allah forgive him and uh, uh, reward him for his good deeds. He was, uh, he was somebody who uh, built, a, built an enormous business empire, had a, had, a, had a huge family, many grandchildren, great grandchildren. He had a home in one of our beautiful beach communities, nice big uh, compound. Uh, and uh, he had children, many of his children had homes right around him. And it was a wonderful situation. And then what happened was after he passed away, everybody started to sue everybody else. And uh, it, was, it was a complete disaster. People started to get sick. People started to move away. Um, and, uh, and just a lot of horrible things happened. And a lot of it was happening right there in public in purview of everybody who just happened to be sitting there in a courtroom in downtown Los Angeles. And I had a number of clients, even at that time, I had a client that was in the lower rungs of that family. And I, and I asked him, I asked him, what, what happened? What, what happened to the, what, what's, what's going on here? And he said, you know, you know what happened? Was that they didn't do it based on the Islamic rules of inheritance. If they did it based on the Islamic rules of inheritance, then, then none of this, none of this would have happened. And so what we're going to be talking about today is how to make sure you have your affairs organized based on the fara'id of, Isla of Islamic inheritance and have the ability to do that here in the United States. And so this is actually a hadith uh, that uh, you need to be able to learn about the fara'id and the fara'id is the Islamic rules of inheritance. It's one of those things that's going to be forgotten and in fact, you can very likely be born here as I was uh, go to khutbah, go to Jumma khutbah practically every single week, die here, and probably never once hear, about a, hear a khutbah about the Islamic rules of inheritance. It is not something that a lot of people know a lot about, much less really act upon. It's not really a done thing by and large within the Muslim community. And so when there are so many families that have these situations where it's going to be fairly typical to what happens in the United States. In the United States, there is a fundamental breakdown in the American family. There isn't a lot of family loyalty. Uh, there are a lot of fights that frequently go on within the family. And so one of the things that we're going to be doing is we're going to be talking a little about the, about, about the Islamic rules of inheritance, or probably a lot about the Islamic rules of inheritance, and how it's different from the American system uh, whatever that means, and we're going to describe that in some detail as well. Okay, so let's, let's talk a little bit about this particular example. Abdullah is married to Salma, and they have a beautiful da daughter, and her name is Sarah. 
Selma dies. Selma dies. What happens when a man and a woman are married and the wife dies? What will typically happen within the first year? Anybody knows? What's going to, what's, what, what is the man going to do probably within a year? Remarry. Yeah, he'll probably remarry. Um, there's actually an adage in estate planning among estate planning attorneys. Um, women, women mourn, men replace. Uh, men will typically want to get remarried very, very quickly. Um, and they do. And we're going to talk a lot about that because that's probably one of the biggest issues that occurs within, within the family structure and, and how things can fall apart pretty quickly. Okay, so Abdullah marries Sultana. She has two daughters of her own. Then another tragic thing happens. Abdullah dies. So we have Abdullah. He has a bunch of property, presumably with Selma. They have a beautiful daughter. Selma dies, Abdullah marries Sultana, she has two daughters, Abdullah dies. Now, our question here is, Selma, Selma, what, what happens to Selma? What does Selma get in inheritance? Sara. Oh, Sara, excuse me. I messed that up. What does Sara get? <laughs> okay, I'll correct that later, even though um, I'm not going to be speaking about this again. Um, what does, oh, at least this particular example, what does Sarah get? Anybody know what Sarah gets? Her mom's share? Mom share, maybe. Um, what will typically happen in the United States is that, well, I'm from Orange County, California. Um, we, have this, uh, we have this place over there. Um, it's, a, it's a popular tourist destination, uh, the castle and stuff. And, uh, and there's this story that's very, very similar to the one that I'm talking about here. Uh, it's this person. And so the story is pretty identical, pretty much identical. And the interesting thing about, about the story of Cinderella, the interesting thing about Cinderella is that it actually doesn't have its origins from Disney or even from the Grimm brothers. Um, the story is actually far older than that. And so Cinderella actually starts with the same situation where she has a father and a mother, she has some wealth, and then what happens to her wealth after it is, is that it, she loses it all because her father gets remarried and he marries a woman who has two, sis, who had two, who has two daughters of, who has two daughters of her own. And then the father dies and her own wealth, the wealth of this orphan, is then weaponized against her. And then she is oppressed in her own home. And so this particular story, this story of Cinderella, actually goes back thousands of years. In fact, literary scholars have found that this story of Cinderella exists in virtually every single language and every single culture throughout all of history. This particular story of an orphan girl that has been, uh, that, uh, that loses her property because her father got remarried and then died happens all the time and it continues to happen every single day, even in this country. So the villain in Cinderella, is it the wicked stepmother, the wicked stepsisters, or the birth parents, or is it just everybody? Is it just everybody, right? Uh, and, and so what happened with Cinderella is that her father, her mother, didn't really bother to be concerned about what would happen to her inheritance. What happens is that the property ends up typically, typically going to the surviving spouse um, in, a, in a lot of situations. And so the Quran actually addresses uh, orphans, I mean, the Quran, uh, orphans, orphans are addressed quite often in the Quran and Hadith. But, uh, And the, the people, those, those, who, those who eat the wealth of orphans, they uh, are consuming nothing but fire, uh, and they will burn in a blaze. And then immediately after this ayah, uh, the, the, the Muwarith ayah, 
concerning the inheritance of your children. And what follows is an incredibly detailed description of how inheritance is supposed to be distributed. Um, inheritance is remarkably detailed in the Quran. It's not the, it's, not the, it's not to say that every single rule that you're going to need with respect to inheritance is in the Quran, but prayer, for example, salah, uh, you, don't, you know you're supposed to do it. You don't actually have a lot of detailed rules uh, concerning it in the Quran. Same with zakah, same with, the, same with a number of things in Islam. But inheritance is remarkably detailed. Here's another thing to consider, and then this is, this is actually where it brings up the contrast between what Muslims have to do and what is typically done in the United States. And so everything in the heavens and the earth and all that it contains belongs to Allah. And so whatever property it is that we have, Whatever things it is and whatever wealth it is that we possess has been entrusted to us. And so we have all these rules in Islam. A lot of these rules, of course, you know about. Certain things are not permissible for Muslims. Certain things you can't do. There are certain ways you can't spend your money. Uh, there are certain ways that you really shouldn't be spending your money. You shouldn't be going gambling. You know, there, there, there are certain things you cannot, be do, you cannot do. Another one of those things is that after you die, you do not have the ability to decide how inheritance is distributed. So let's talk a little bit about how the U.S. inheritance landscape works. Now I I am in California. I do I do have I do see things all over the country, but I am in California. I'm mostly familiar with California. Understand that there are going to be differences in different states because uh, inheritance, probate, things like that. that. Those are governed largely by state law. However, there are some overlying uh, there are some principles of law that are common throughout the entire country. So. Very common is joint tenancy with right of survivorship. How many of you have ever heard of joint tenancy with right of survivorship? Right. That is typically the way people own their property in the United States. That's usually the way people know to own their property. That's usually the way real estate agents know how to sell property to couples. Because what happens? Both people own the home. A husband and a wife own a home together. They don't really own it 50-50. They more own it 100-100. What happens is after one person dies, by operation of what's in the deed, the, the surviving spouse ends up getting everything. Joint accounts, incredibly common. A husband and wife just get everything together. They just put all of their money together. They put everything in each other's names. And they just own everything together. Very common culturally here in the United States, that's how we do things. Beneficiary designations is another one. We have 401ks, some people have life insurance, things like that. Who do, who's going to be the beneficiary of your accounts? Usually the first thing that comes to somebody's mind, it's going to be my wife, it's going to be my husband, he'll take care of everything, she'll take care of everything, etc. That's what goes on. Wills and trusts. Um, these are things that are relatively common instruments. Jazakallah khair. These are relatively common instruments that people use. One thing that people do not necessarily realize that frequently it does not matter. It does not matter how you own your property or what you do. The system tends to be rigged. The system tends to be rigged to give everything to the surviving spouse. The other one is intestacy. What's intestacy? Intestacy occurs when you don't have a will, you don't have a trust, you haven't really done anything, and ever, there's property in your name, and you need a will to pass it on. Well, if you don't have a will, no problem. The government, the state government, is going to give you a will, and that is referred to as intestacy. What typically happens under most intestacy statutes in the United States? The surviving spouse, the surviving spouse will end up getting everything. And so, that's what happens. Now, another thing about wills and trusts typically is that we have this system, we have this system of free alienation of property. 
free alienation of property. That is fundamental to American law in many respects. Now, free alienation of property refers to the concept that it's my money, my money, my money. I can do with it as I please. So, it's your money. You could spend it however you want. You want to go on vacation? Go on vacation. You want to go off gambling? Go gambling. You want to... Uh, uh, you you, you want to you wanna take all of your money, put it in a big giant pile of cash and burn it in front of a group of orphans? Go ahead, you can do that, right? That's, that's the American way of handling money. You can do that if you feel like you can do that. So what we have in the Islamic system of inheritance is a uniform system. And so the beauty of that particular system is that there are shares that come from the Sharia. And it's specific shares, those shares represent both a minimum and a maximum. That is the inheritance you are getting. You, based on your own passion and prejudice, your own feelings of what child is more deserving or what parent needs inheritance, your own feelings do not really matter here. And so after you are gone, after you're gone, it's not going to be the case where children are going to be arguing amongst themselves that you manipulated dad or this happened or that happened. Um, all of those types of things that happen when people die, normally when people die, they will, uh, the, when, when, when children are angry, they don't blame the the, they don't blame the deceased, they blame the living. They might blame the deceased uh, for being manipulated or, or whatever the case may be, particularly when, the, when, they, get, uh, when they get older. Uh, there's going to be favoritism. There's going to be all sorts of things that would happen. In fact, when people get older and then they start planning with inheritance, uh, as, we, as we're going to discuss, people start getting a little bit wacky uh, in how they do things. What happens here when you do things based on the Islamic rules of inheritance is after you die, there's actually nobody to be angry with. Even if you were not particularly religious, and this is, I've seen this many times before, even for children that are not particularly religious, they will understand that, look, this was a believing Muslim, he did this based on the Islamic rules, there really isn't anything to be upset about, it is what it is. Okay, so let's go to another example, hopefully I'm going to get all the names not mixed up on this one. Salman is married to Rania. Um, he has two daughters, Firdos and Hafsa, and son Ibrahim, of father Muhammad, and a mother Noor. Okay, so we have this set of we have this set of uh, of relatives. Now, one of the things about this is that everybody, everybody on this list, two daughters, a son, a father, and a mother, according to the Quran, all of these people, all of these people have a right to inheritance, and so. So Hafsa, Hafsa has a right to inheritance, not because Salman likes him or loves him, or because Salman, uh, because uh, because you know because Hafsa returns his phone calls, or because she married the right person, or whatever. All of those things are irrelevant. She gets inheritance because the Quran actually says she gets inheritance, and the inheritance is actually going to be specified. Now, another thing about the Islamic rules of inheritance is that there are people who inherit based on the existence or non-existence of other particular people. And so, for example, if a father, if a father is, uh, is deceased, but the paternal grandfather is alive, then the paternal grandfather might take that person's place. In certain other instances, siblings may inherit. And, uh, and on and on, and there might, be, there might be various other scenarios that I could create where a wide range of people might have a right to inheritance. However, for the most part, within the Muslim community, especially people who are going to arrange for their inheritance, what do they have? They have parents, they have children, they have a spouse, and usually this is going to be the universe, and typically it's going to be the entire universe of people who are going to inherit. So this is roughly the way it would work. Um, you're going to have Ibrahim who's going to get probably most, I mean, and then you've got, uh, you've got the wife, the wife gets one-eighth. Um, the, uh, 
the, the parents get one sixth, so the father and mother get exactly the same, and the son and the daughters get different shares. So two shares for the boy, for every one share for the girl. So that's, that's typically the way it's going to work, and that's going to work, it's going to work that way uniformly throughout, I mean, there really wouldn't be any disagreement um, from anyone about this would be how the shares of inheritance is going to be, and, and, and that's, what, that's what's going to happen. Now, there are a number of things where you're going to look at it and say, hmm, I have an issue with this or I have an issue with that. We're probably going to discuss discuss that a little bit later um, uh, as, far as, as far as the particular shares of the particular concerns that people have with the shares. But that's basically what would happen with the shares. Now, let's change the facts just a little bit. Ibrahim, Ibrahim's adopted. Ibrahim's adopted. So, Ibrahim is an adopted son and adopted sons, as some of you may know, based on uh, the history and the, and the sira, uh, and, uh, and of course there's an ayah of the Quran about this, that, that, chil that uh, children who are, I mean, that uh, adopted sons are actually not your real sons. They're not your real sons for all purposes, and you can actually treat them as your sons, you can adopt, you can, you can do those types of things, but they're not going to be some, the same, they're not going to get inheritance in the same way um, as a son would normally get. And so what, what's going to happen here is that he no longer has a right to inheritance. Does that mean he can get nothing? No, not necessarily. It doesn't necessarily mean that Ibrahim's going to get nothing. I'm going to describe that a little bit here. So this is his right to inheritance. These are the shares. Now, what you might find here, and I, the numbers, I guess my graphing thing didn't actually do it in fractions, but uh, what you're going to find here is that everybody is going to get less than the fixed share. So the Quran actually has some fixed shares. Um, children, children get a variable share typically, uh, meaning that the share changes depending on what the fixed shares are. So parents, according to the Quran, the mother and the father get one-sixth each. The wife, if there are children, gets one-eighth. Now, what happens here is that there are two daughters, and as a result of two daughters, the Quran actually addresses that specifically, they get two-thirds. So if there are two daughters, between the two of them, they're going to split two-thirds. Now, what you're going to find here is that the shares of inheritance is not one-sixth for the father and the mother, it's not one-eighth for the wife, and it's actually not two-thirds as between the two daughters. And the reason for that is because all of these shares combined don't equal to one, and so what scholars have done is that they've compressed them so that proportionally it would be the same relative to each other, but it's not going to be, um, it's not going to be the same share as is specified in the Quran because, uh, because of this particular calculation issue. It's a relatively common issue. It comes up all the time. And so you need, you, so you need to know that, uh, that this is something that, uh, that Islamic jurists have, uh, have addressed and have addressed a long, long time ago. Um, and, uh, and so these would be the shares of inheritance. Now, going back to the issue of adoption, that brings us up to the issue of the wasiyah. Now, you can give a wasiyah of up to one third of your estate. One third of your estate, uh, one third of whatever it is that you have, you can give for a beneficial purpose, and that is typically going to be either charities or it's going to be people who are otherwise not entitled to inheritance under the Islamic rules of inheritance. Adopted children are, uh, is a pretty, pretty common one. Um, and, uh, and then also people have, say, relatives overseas where they, you know, they, they have poor relatives, things like that. They want to be able to give, um, they want to be able to give inheritance uh, under those circumstances. So if, say, for example, a person has a non-Muslim wife, non-Muslim wife isn't entitled to inheritance, but that person can, of course, receive, uh, receive some inheritance, uh, not inheritance by right, but, uh, but they'd be able to benefit from the wasiyah. Um, Charities is another thing that, uh, that's relatively common as well. Uh, and, uh, and the other thing that, uh, that you should also consider, oh, by the way, I have a resource guide. You can text this, uh, um, ICNA Mass, text the, text the word ICNA Mass to 44222. Um, I have some templates. I have some information on the difference between a will and a trust. So if you want like a template for a will, uh, that type of thing, then uh, you can just, temp you can just uh, text 44222 and uh, text the word ICNAMAS and I'll send that over to you. Okay, gifts and property agreements. Um, so 
here's one problem that we often come up with, and, and I'll um, I'll talk about this a little bit uh, a little bit further uh, further down the line as well. But uh, many people are concerned that the surviving spouse, if there are no children, gets gets one quarter, and if there um, are children, gets one eighth. And so the major question here is one eighth of what? One eighth of what? Right? Um, and so what happens here culturally in the United States is that a husband and wife typically have everything together. It's what we call the partnership theory of marriage. And so the idea behind marriage here is that marriage is an economic partnership rather than just a social family type partnership. And so we have, uh, we have this system where, um, and, and you know, in, in California it's a lot more formalized, it's, it's called community property, but in other states as well, it's fairly typical for a husband and wife to each own 50% of everything. Um, they just come to this type of an agreement. And so um, many people will wonder, and, and this, this happens often you know, in, in, uh, in, in my state, Texas, a few other places, is that how is a system like that compatible with the Islamic rules of inheritance? And so it's, uh, it's not the same thing. It's not the same thing. Um, if you wanted to give your wife, I mean, if you wanted to write your wife a million dollar check right now, there really isn't anything in Islam that stops you from doing that. Um, unless there's something, you know, unless you're doing something otherwise haram or whatever. But if you had the money and you, you were, felt generous and you wanted to give like a bunch of money to your wife or, or to your husband or whatever the case may be, you can, you can totally do that. And so um, there's that. Um, the, other, the other thing that you, you will need to do with every, single, with every single arrangement that you have with the spouse is that you should have a formalized property agreement. And so the notion that everybody, everybody owns everything and that the husband has stuff and the wife has stuff, but it's all the same stuff, the problem there is that you're not able to protect the rights of inheritance if you don't really truly know what you own or what, the people, what people's rights are going to be after you die. And so you need to be able to differentiate between your property and your spouse's property, both a husband and wife, need to be separate economic units, whatever that is. And I'm completely, I'm, I'm completely agnostic on the question of the husband should have this much or the wife should have that much. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter. I think that that is a private arrangement as between a husband and a wife as to who owns what property. Just make sure that you have that down. You know, you know what property it is that you own. Okay. Um, here's one other thing that... Uh, um, that comes up from time to time. Uh, people might ask, well, say there is a, say I have a son, a son who, or uh, I have a multimillionaire son, right? He's doing really, really well, fabulously successful, wonderful family, everything's going great, and there's this daughter, there's this daughter who's, who has Down syndrome, uh, still kind of young, probably won't get married, uh, and will probably need a lot of assistance throughout her life. How is it fair? How is it fair that the daughter gets half the inheritance of the son? Right? How is that fair? And so that would be the question that people would have. And so the problem with that particular question is that it presupposes the notion that inheritance, inheritance exists to solve some sort of a social problem, some sort of a health concern. Inheritance exists for no, nothing, no, no purpose like that at all. Inheritance is what happens when you can't take stuff with you anymore. And that's going to happen when you don't know. And inheritance is going to be distributed to people you're not exactly sure who. You're not exactly sure what the proportions are going to be. You probably have some idea. But what we do know is it's going to be in a world you know absolutely nothing about and the circumstances of which you are completely ignorant. You do not know that your daughter is going to need more than your son. You just have absolutely no idea. But if you feel that a daughter needs more help than a son, it is your duty to take care of that now and not 
in inheritance. You take care of that now, and you can take care of that through gifts. Um, there are these things, there's, there's something called a special needs trust that, uh, that you can easily set up. Um, and that's, a, that's an entire process where uh, people particularly who have disability um, can, uh, can, can benefit from, and there's a, there's, a, there's a bunch of rules with respect to that. But even if it weren't the case where there was disability, even if it were something where you want to just deal with one child or help one child more than another because, uh, because of uh, what you think is the equities with respect to the matter, um, and, and of course you want to be fair, but, uh, but, uh, but you also don't, you don't fair doesn't necessarily mean the same as equal. That's true when you're alive and that's true when you're not alive. Uh, and so inheritance isn't meant for that purpose. Okay. So, a wasiya versus a will. A wasiya is not the same thing as a last will and testament. A lot of times, and, and there might be some marketing or there might be certain things that people are people have uh, become familiar with where, where the notion of a wasiya is kind of the same thing as doing a last will and testament. It's not. A wasiya concerns one third of your estate that you can give at your discretion with some limitations. Um, so for example, you cannot give a wasiya to somebody who already has uh, the right to inheritance under the Islamic rules of inheritance. Um, probate is a process in court where if you need a dead person's signature to transfer property from one person to another, then you have a probate. So a will under state law throughout the entire country only concerns what is known as probate property. Um, and so a lot of different types of property will be excluded from that. And that's actually one of the reasons why it is difficult and in many instances virtually impossible to have something called an Islamic will. Um, because a lot of the types of property that people have, or at least by itself, a lot of the times the way people own their property is through things like the joint tenancy uh, or joint accounts, things like that. And, uh, and then when they die, everything just passes on to the surviving spouse. And I've actually seen this before where somebody writes down a will, an Islamic will, they have all the Islamic shares down, and then they go for Hajj, and then come back, live a few more years, die, and 20 years later, the, it's just sort of sitting there in a family photo album. Nothing was done. It's just, it's just there. And, uh, and so you'll, you'll, wanna, you'll wanna be able to know that uh, a will only concerns probate property. One of the other things that a will does address as well is guardianship of minors. So everybody has that, and you usually use it as a backup in the event that you have probate property, but that's about it as far as a will. You're not going to use it for a lot of things, except for a backup, and as well as if you have minor children, you'll want to be able to name guardians for minor children. <coughs> So I already addressed this. Um, you can do a will based on the Islamic rules of inheritance. Typically that might be done by people who own property individually and uh, they don't have a lot of it because you're avoiding probate. Now probate tends to be a relatively expensive process. So um, and that depends on the state though. Uh, in states like California, it's exorbitantly expensive. Certain other states, it's not that expensive, but even so it's a court supervised process. Like I was talking about before, like I was talking about before in that case uh, with, uh, in Los Angeles, it's all a completely public process. And, and a lot of strange things can happen during court proceedings. Now, let's talk a little bit about what a living trust is. Um, so there are three parties to a contract and a living trust involves, involves three different types of people. Um, and, and you, you are doing inheritance based on the Islamic rules of inheritance by creating a contract and there is a grantor and a grantor puts property in the trust, a grantor puts property in the trust for the benefit of, uh, for the benefit of the beneficiary but gives it to the trustee for the benefit of the beneficiary. So you have the grantor, you have the trustee, and you have the beneficiary. Now, while a person is alive and healthy, they are all three of these things. 
You're still the beneficiary because you're still going to use your money. You're still going to manage your money. But then what happens is after you die, you say, such and such person is going to handle my estate to divvy it up. And it's not done in court. It's done outside of court. Um, it's done outside of court, outside of court supervision. And, uh, and it could be an incredibly detailed system that deals with things like, well, how do you deal with disputes, those sorts of things. So there are these parties to a, to a contract. There's, a, there's no court supervision. It tends to be dramatically less expensive um, to, to deal with it uh, when you do it privately. Um, and uh, uh, one of the problems, though, with a trust is that it's a relationship. It's a relationship more than it is a document, and it's a relationship of trust. And so it's incredibly important to, to be sure that you have the right people that you trust for this purpose. And so you're going to name particular individuals to handle your affairs. And this doesn't just happen um, at death. It might even happen at incapacity. So one of the problems that we have uh, within, I mean, I don't think it's just a Muslim thing. It just, it just happens. It's part of, it's part of life. Is that there are a lot of people, and you might have met a lot of these people and not know it, but there are a lot of people out there that are walking, talking, telling jokes, and everything is fine as far as you can tell. But if you decided to scam them and ask them for like twenty thousand dollars for no particular reason, they'll probably give it to you. And. There's a lot of people like that, and family members get incredibly concerned. And so what happens is that as people age sometimes, they lose their executive decision-making ability. And so family members will then typically take them to probate court for something called a conservatorship. And a lot of times these trusts are used for the purpose of avoiding a conservatorship and making sure that decision-making with respect to who, um, who can make financial decisions is kept private. So you don't, you know, um, normally conservatorships are completely public and they're very humiliating for, uh, for the people involved. And you, you want to be able to avoid that if at all possible. Marriage. Uh, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about what I think of as being the biggest concern. It's not probate. It's not, uh, a lot of times it's not even the specific shares of inheritance. So those are, of course, vital and far than all of that stuff. But if... I were to give one piece of advice, one piece of estate planning advice, like that would be the most important advice. Um, it's more than getting a good lawyer, that's important, uh, doing a trust, doing a will. More important than any of that stuff is marry wisely. Marry wisely, right? Be very, very, very careful about who you end up with. And so I'm going to recommend an app that you use to swipe right and left. No, I'm not going to do that. Um, I had a situation once, uh, and this is actually the Quran. I mean, it's it's actually it's actually funny with the with the um, I, I, I was uh, I, I was in uh, um, one of these educational programs for attorneys, uh, and. Uh, how one attorney was, was talking about how he treats, he treats children, he treats, when he does estate planning for, for older people, he treats children as the enemy. That's just what he does. And I thought, oh, that's really interesting. Um, some people will also maybe treat the wife as the enemy. The children will typically treat the wife as the enemy. They, they usually don't, uh, especially if it's, an, if it's an older person who got remarried, um, the adult children will usually refer to her as, as that woman. I think that's the usual term that they usually refer to, to wives as. Um, but, but the Quran does say that among your wives and children are their enemies too. Uh, they're, they're, they're maybe, some, some may be enemies, right? Um, and uh, I, I, had a, I had a case once. Uh, it, was, it was a man who was an incredible businessman. Uh, he was an inventor. He was an industrialist. Uh, really, really sharp guy. Um, his wife died. Um, his wife died, and uh, uh, you know, obviously, he was incredibly despondent. He he gets a he gets a wrong number phone call. I mean, it was just somebody dialed it was a wrong number. Except he talks to this person. It's a woman. He talks to this woman. He ends up marrying her, um, and uh, they had this and they had this really successful apparently marriage for like 20 years until the guy died. 
until the, until the guy died. What, what he didn't know for all that 20 years, and apparently the family didn't know this either, is that she was a convicted felon, and her entire family was just this family of grifters. Um, they stole an immense amount of money from him throughout this entire period, uh, and, uh, and they just had, they had absolutely no idea about any of this. Um, but like I, like I said, be, be very, very careful. Um, so you need to be able to have, like, like I said before, make sure that you have the husband and the wife own something. Um, they have to have some property. Um, and I'm going, to, I'm going to describe the process of, of how we should do estate planning, particularly with respect to married couples. Um, one other big hazard, by the way, it's not just older people who get married, and that could cause a, like an immense fitna within the family. Younger people get married, sometimes that could be an issue as well. I had one situation where there, were the, there was this young couple that came in and there was, a, there was a mom who owned part of the property with her son. And, and by the way, never do that. Never own a property with your son or daughter. I mean, it's just, it's just a bad idea for a wide range of reasons. Uh, if the questions and answers, if, if you want to know what the reasons are, I can give them to you. But, but just, just generally don't do that. Um, but, but what happened here was that there was an issue with the daughter-in-law and the son. And the son and the daughter-in-law uh, of this woman came over to, to see me and asked for my, you know, they, it, was, it, was, it was incredible, actually. It was, uh, the, the woman was, uh, was talking to me and telling me about uh, this dispute that she was having with her mother-in-law and, uh, and constantly baiting her husband about how he's the man of the house and he should take charge. And ba What they really wanted me to do and the purpose behind in, in, in being in my office was that they wanted me to kick the mom out of the house. Um, and, and so one thing that you might have seen within the Muslim community as well is that there's a lot of cases of people who end up giving their house to their kids and getting kicked out of their house because of daughter-in-law issues or some sort of in-law issues. It just, it just seems to happen a lot. Um, but that's not the only reason. Even if you don't expect that people are going to change, even if you expect that your relationships are always going to be wonderful throughout the entire and throughout your entire life, it's just, it's just a bad idea to do that. Um, okay, the family home. Um, here's a problem. Throughout most of human history, the biggest expense for a family was what? Anybody know? Food. Food. Food, yeah. The biggest expense for a family was food, right? The biggest expense for family now is housing. Far and away, right? Um, I, guess, I guess it depends on where you live. But for the most part, it's, it's housing. And so when we talk about, well, inheritance is going to be one eighth, um, what, what do we do there? Well, we say that, well, the wife, the wife, needs to, wife needs to live under a bridge just because I died. That's just what's going to happen, right? Uh, because she's not going to have any money. Because we have this house, it's most of our wealth, um, what are we going to do? Well, then you're going to have this family house. And then what you're, what's going to happen afterwards? Um, you're going to have a house that will probably need to be sold to distribute inheritance to various people. Or, in the alternative, you can have a house that is owned by multiple people, multiple family members. Um, and then what happens? As we age... We want to be able to continue to live in dignity with some, some level of security. And, and what happens is, as we become adults, as children become adults, they get more drama in their lives. They get, they get marital problems. They get business problems. They get into bankruptcy. They get a whole bunch of stuff that just keeps happening. And as you're aging, you figure whatever drama is happening to your kids then becomes your drama and you're always worried about being kicked out of your house. Even if your relationship with your children is completely normal, even if your relationship with your daughter-in-law is completely healthy, you can still worry about that. And so what you want to be able to do is create some sort of a structure where you have some protection, you have some asset protection, and you have some security where the surviving spouse will have the ability to continue to live in the house, but at the same time, you are not denying anybody their right to inheritance under the Islamic rules of inheritance. And so, you're able to do that with trust. 
And so one way of looking at it, um, and this is how I often describe it to my, my clients, it's probably a really imperfect description, but maybe it just it does the job. Um, say, say, for example, um, say, 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 um, say Hina. Hina, she, uh, she owns, um, this is completely hypothetical, by the way, none of this is true. Um, say she owns, or maybe, it is, maybe some of it is true, I don't know. Maybe she, she owns 10,000 stock, there's 10,000 shares of stock in Apple Corporation. Okay, so she owns 10,000 shares of stock in Apple. Um, also, also in this example, um, Hina has a completely um, irrational prejudice against Japan and the Japanese people. Now, would Hina, with her 10,000 hypothetical shares and hypothetical um, prejudice against the Japanese people, be able to walk into Apple headquarters anytime she feels like it and tell the CEO of Apple that I don't want you doing any business with Japan or the Japanese people. And the answer to that would be no, no, you can't do that. You can't do that. Um, just because you own something doesn't mean you have the full right to do and say whatever it is that you want. You do have certain rights. Um, when you're a shareholder, but you don't have the right to do that. And so what we want to be able to do when we protect inheritance is use certain types of structures where you are providing some security and you're providing rights, but the rights, uh, inheritance and cash are not the same thing. We don't necessarily always have to treat them in the same, as the same thing, but we also don't want to deny people their inheritance either. Okay, let's, uh, let's move on because I'm a... Uh, I'm moving, uh, I'm moving a lot, but we'll probably have some opportunity for, for questions or more, more examples as well, um, because I'm talking a lot more quickly than I had anticipated I would. But um, Adnan has a 35-year-old son, um, Ilyas. He has not seen or spoken to, he's not, he hasn't seen or spoken to him in eight years. Um, they've been estranged. Um, Adnan checked social media and found Ilyas is... Uh, He's faucet, you know, he's uh, openly doing stuff. He's on social media, he's drinking, or he's in Vegas having a good time. Uh, he thinks his son isn't a really good Muslim. Um, he's not even sure if his son is a Muslim. I mean, he hasn't asked him. Um, so so what, what does he do? Does, does, the son, does the son Ilyas have a right to inheritance? Um, and the answer to that is you, you can't, first of all, there, I mean, there are two, two parts of this. You can't be estranged for your son from, for, from your son for eight years. I mean, that's not something that you should be doing. I mean, it's uh, you're not allowed to cut ties in Islam, um, regardless. And so, so one of the things is you're supposed to maintain family. And, and, and this is actually one of the functions that one of the benefits of doing things based on the Islamic rules of inheritance is that people will need to be able to be close enough to their families. And I think I think that even I mean, no matter how, um, I mean, no no matter who the Muslim is, I mean. Generally, uh, if there, somebody is estranged from their family and they haven't seen or talked to their family in, in many years, normally people are a little bit ashamed that that's the situation. It's, it's a really bad situation to have, but it's a situation that's relatively common. Um, and so, what uh, what does he what does he do? Um, a few things about that. I mean, he has a right to inheritance. Ilyas has the right to inheritance in Islam. You do not care if Ilyas is a good Muslim or a bad Muslim. You don't necessarily care that the person is estranged. Um, you don't even care about other things that that person might have done. You, you, have, a, you have an obligation. Inheritance is his right in the Quran. Um, there's another aspect to it, though, as well. And, well, what if, uh, what if you want to be able to protect Ilyas? Maybe there's a, there's a situation where there's a, um, there's a drug or alcohol abuse problem. Right? How would you deal with, with a thing like that? You can keep it in trust and have a trustee manage the property for that individual. You can do that for that individual's own benefit. That's okay. Um, uh, and in that instance, you're not giving inheritance directly to Ilyas, but you are giving it to, to a trust. Um, another thing about this, um, because I come across it quite often, is where somebody doesn't actually know whether or not their child is Muslim because you know they, they, talk, they talk to their kids. And by the way, how many of you know people who have children that have become adults and parents are a little bit disappointed with their kids? Anybody know people like that? 
Um, how many of you won't raise your hand no matter what I say or do today? <laughs> so, um, anyway, uh, we, we, also, we also have this, uh, this issue where people will ask, well, maybe I can just give him a call and ask him if he's Muslim. Uh, no, don't, don't do that. Don't, don't ever do that. If you've been estranged from your kid, um, the first question that you ask your kid is, and are you a Muslim? Um, because that, that, could, that, could cause, that could cause more problems. Um, just the, the child might just say no just to upset you. Um, and, and so that's not how to start a relationship. You're not going to go be. You're not going to go do an Akida test. Uh, you're not going to go ask him about Qadianis or anything like that. You're not going to. You're not going to be doing anything like that. Uh, you want to be able to. You're going to be able to repair your relationship, obviously. Um, but you can't. You can't be in the business of uh, of denying inheritance. Um, inheritance is not yours to deny. Um, one one situation, of course, is when the person actually says that um, that they're not Muslim anymore, right? I mean, they, they say this in Thanksgiving dinner or they write a letter. I had a, I had a, um, I had a really sad situation before where um, there, there, was a, the, there was a man, um, an elderly man who had two children. Uh, both of them came to, me, came to my office. Uh, one, of, one of them moved away afterwards, and they were, I mean, they, this, this is somebody who used to give khutbahs when he was younger, uh, you know, had a, had a, had a Muslim, fa had, a, had a very traditionally Muslim family, and then uh, suddenly he writes, he writes to his father and says he's a Christian now, and he wants his father to become Christian. Um, other, other, you know, other, uh, there have been a number of really, a number of situations like that. He has to come in, and he says, well, I need to take him off. I mean, when somebody is no longer Muslim, they no longer have the right to inheritance. And so you actually can't, you can't put them in under those circumstances. But where you actually don't know, um, you, you really should give that person the benefit of the doubt and, uh, and add that person. Don't, don't, go around quizzing, don't go around quizzing that individual. Don't do any of that stuff. Um, but uh, you know, if once, once, the, once the relationship's been repaired and then you find out for sure that the, that the person, that the child is, is no longer Muslim, then you have to act accordingly. Okay. Um, Letitia, and there's gonna be time for questions, so we'll, we'll get to that if there are any. Um, Letitia is 57, she's single. She's been Muslim for four years. Uh, she has two adult children, Brian and Amy, neither of whom is Muslim. She would like for them to get something, but does not want to violate the Islamic rules of inheritance. Okay, so how do we, how do, we do this? Um, Muslims get inheritance. Non-Muslims do not get inheritance by right. Muslims, uh, I'm sorry, non-Muslims can benefit from the wasiya. So, Letitia can definitely give, she can definitely give her estate, one third of it, to her children. But then the question is, what happens to the other two thirds? Because she's not married. If she were married, everything can go to her husband. Um, but if she is um, single and she has no Muslim relatives at all, we have a bit of a problem. And so typically what happens under traditional Islamic law is that by, by right, everything goes to Beit al-Mal. Now, we actually don't have a Beit al-Mal. Uh, there might be a charity named Beit al-Mal, but you know, tradi tr traditionally, as understood, we don't have an Islamic treasury. And so a lot of times people will say, well, a charity, give everything to charity. Char like, you know, that charity is like the equivalent, the modern equivalent of Beit al -Mal. I don't, I don't know that that's true and I don't necessarily know that it's truly analogous. Um, but, but let's go with that for a moment. What if she wants to give Brian and Amy even more? What if she wants to give more than one third? And so one possibility is that she can give a gift. She can give a gift to them. Um, what's the problem with giving a gift? is once you've given it during your lifetime, it's gone. It's not yours anymore. And so if you are relying on something like your family home, if you're relying on your bank account, stuff like that, you, you, can't, you can't do that. You can't just, be, uh, you, you can't, uh, just give away assets and, uh, and expect that uh, you'll be able to, uh, to have that same economic security. Um, you know, you, they're, they're, it could happen. I mean, it could very well happen. Um, and and maybe maybe Letitia is comfortable with respect to that, but uh, 
but it's going to be a problem for her. So a few different potential solutions. If, for example, she has a home, she can give away her home or a future interest in her home. Now, not an interest that is connected to death, meaning that it's not to say, after I die, you get my home. That's inheritance. But if you say, I'm going to give away my home to you in 10 years, 20 years, something like that. So you create a gift. 20 years from now, the house belongs to my children. Um, and then you create this trust where you revert back a right to continue to live in the home, but also you have to pay rent to the trust, meaning to your children. So you continue to pay rent uh, for the benefit of living in your home, and you, you can't ever get kicked out of your home. So you can give property away in this manner. And a lot of the times, not just in the situation with Letitia, but say for example, somebody, had a, a, somebody wanted to give more to their daughters because they feel, felt like you know, they, they, they want to give their, their daughter a gift. You can't give a gift during, after death, but you can give it during lifetime. And if you want to give away, say, your house, you can give away your house. Just make sure you have the ability to continue to live in the house. Don't just, don't just give it away because bad things can happen. Okay. Um, here's, a, here's one thing that, uh, one, one, uh, one situation that I had before. Somebody, somebody says he has, uh, he, wants to give, he wants to give all of his money. He had like $17 million. He wanted to give all of his money to the masjid after he died. Um, and, uh, and I told him that, look, you have kids. You can't be doing that. I mean, yeah, giving, you can give the money, you can give everything to the masjid right now. I mean, if you wanna, you wanna just you know, write a big giant check and uh, give everything away to the masjid now, you can totally do that. But you cannot do that after you die. Um, in Europe, uh, in Europe, the Catholic Church actually became incredibly rich and powerful. Um, and one way they did that uh, was that they would go to the deathbed of a very wealthy person. And they would say, if you give all of your wealth, all of your possessions to the church, we will grant you absolution. And when you're on your deathbed, that absolution thing looks pretty good. You're going to give everything away. Well, forget the kids. Yeah, forget the kids at that point. Um, we can't do that. There's nobody in the Muslim community or anywhere that can say, hey, all your sins are forgiven if you just give all, of the, all your money to my charity. Um, that's, it's, that's not going to work. You need to make sure and take care of the rights of the children. Um, that, that particular individual was, uh, you know, I was like, I can't do it. You can't, you can't just give everything to the masjid. Um, it's like, look, I, I worked really hard for my money. Um, I haven't seen my kids in 20 years. They've had their own children, my grandchildren. I've never seen them. Why should I give them anything? Like, and then this is a guy who wanted to give every, everything to the masjid. Thank God, thank God in America, we don't have to do Islamic inheritance. Um, and I, I, unfortunately, family relationships have become so immensely toxic that people feel like giving their money away to a, a, a nonprofit or to charitable institutions um, would somehow trump what, hap what, what, what their rights are that are actually ordained in the Quran. And so what that individual should really do is consider um, is consider making, making certain that inheritance is distributed even if he doesn't have a good relationship with his children. Um, many times people will come to me, because I'm a Muslim lawyer, um, and they'll just come because, you know, they're Muslim, I under, maybe I understand the culture, or I don't know what the case is, but they say, we want to do Islamic stuff, but I disagree with some other things in Islam, and I want to do some, make some adjustments. I want to do things that are a little bit different. Um, in this way or that way. And my, my response to something like that is, look, the Quran ordains a particular thing, I and mean, the, sharia ordain, the, the Sharia mandates a particular way of inheritance. And you're asking me to violate an ordinance of Allah and do it for money. 
what is that? And and uh, it's 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 a it's a remarkable thing where people will literally pass by or drive past hundreds of other lawyers that would easily do it for them, and then come and tell me that hey, I want to do things, but you know, Islamic inheritance is something that I am. That, that's uncomfortable for me, or I, I don't want to do it that way. Inheritance is not yours to give. Um, okay, so this is that uh, thing I was telling you about text, Ikna Mass, at 44222. Um, this, is, um, this is going to be your responsibility. Um, in other countries, um, you don't really need to think about it. Uh, in, in many other Muslim countries. Uh, inheritance is a part of the law, the, the faraid is part of the law, and so what happens is uh, um, you don't need to do a will or a trust or anything like that. Inheritance shares are, 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 t are often done correctly. Not that shenanigans don't take place in other countries or that women aren't denied inheritance or, or things like that happen. You'll see stories like that. Um, but here, that's something that you need to be able to be um, be incredibly proactive with. Um, there's this uh, uh, there's this hadith. It's un unbecoming of a Muslim to let two nights pass without making without making a will uh, concerning it. And so anyway, that's uh, that's my uh, that's my presentation on this. If there are any questions, I'm I'm happy to answer them. We have about 20 minutes. That we yeah, we have some time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, when we open account like 401k and other things investment. Everyone asks you that write down your beneficiaries. Yes. So we have to write down the name at any point, the beneficiary's name. So can we put down our kid's name uh, as an inheritance way, like part two parts and two parts and one part, or anything we can put down? So, um, but we don't know what's going to happen. Maybe it will be given to them after I die, or maybe it will be given before. I mean, I don't know. If I retire, I have no idea. That's an excellent, excellent question, and um, you know, I, I, that's an excellent question. It's actually a fairly complex answer. Um, yeah. So, um, so, so 401ks, uh, 401k. Okay. So the the question is, what do you do? Uh, and, and, and by the way, in this particular area, the lake could get pretty deep, and so, but, uh, but, but anyway, we'll we'll, we'll deal with that. Um, with respect to 401ks. Um, you can, uh, I'm sorry, the question, I have to repeat the question. The question is about 401ks, what do you do about beneficiary designation forms? With respect to 401ks, um, you can name beneficiaries consistent with the Islamic rules of inheritance. So there's this website you can go to, um, islamicsoftware.org slash IRTH, and you can calculate the shares of inheritance. And then you can just specify that, yes, inheritance shares will go this way, this way, this way, this way. The, there are a few problems with that. Um, one, of the, one of the problems is that uh, the surviving spouse gets to do a spousal rollover. Like I mentioned at the beginning of the program, um, there, the system tends to be rigged to give everything to the surviving spouse. And there might be that the surviving spouse will want the 401k, and so you might, in the property agreement, sp uh, specify that if the surviving spouse gets the, prop gets, the, uh, gets the 401k, then the surviving spouse will compensate the other beneficiaries with other property. So there's that possibility, because the surviving spouse gets more of a benefit from getting that. The other thing that you also want to consider doing is if you have a wasiya, if you have a wasiya and you're giving to charity, so you can give up to one third of your estate in charity. So you will probably want to give the 401k assets to charity. And the reason for that is 401k assets are assets that you have never paid taxes on before. Um, and uh, and it's, it's considered uh, income in respect of decedent. So it is taxed based on the um, income tax, the highest marginal income tax rate of the person receiving the inheritance. So if your daughter is in the 30% tax bracket, the tax rate is going to be 30%. Anybody know what a, what a, what a masjid's tax bracket is? Yeah. Right. So um, if you're going to give it to a masjid or if you're going to give it to ikna or something like that, then you know, you're better off giving your 401k assets to the charity. Now, 
one of the other problems is that you don't necessarily know the size, the relative size of your 401k. If anybody's been paying attention to the stock market lately, you know that, well, it might be more than one third, it might be less than one third, and, and you don't necessarily know. And so one thing I will frequently recommend is that the beneficiary be a trust. So you beneficiary designate your uh, 401k to the trust, and then make sure that everything is done proportionally based on the Islamic rules of inheritance. And if you have a wasiyah and you're giving something in charity, then the, the asset that you're going to use to give to charity will come from the, uh, the 401k assets because that is the best asset to give to charity. Because remember, if you're giving money from your regular board brokerage account or from your bank account and it goes to that same daughter with a 30% tax rate, there is no inheritance tax. Um, there might be a state inheritance tax depending on the state that you live in, but there is no, uh, in, uh, there is no estate tax associated with that and there won't be any income tax um, associated with that either. So um, that's, that's the answer to your question. Question. Um, brother over here, and then I'll go to the. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, why don't you pick? I'm <laughs> so sorry. My bad. Uh, my question is you mentioned the, uh, on the house, me and my wife on the, on the house, okay, and if both of us have wealth, Islamic, according to Sharia, okay, because you know you worry about you die and then you want your wife to live in that house. Okay? Right. For, for the rest of their life, and then the kids can have it. But, but I, didn't, I didn't understand, I don't know even if you suggested the solution for this, is that you know, when you die, okay, you want your wife to live in it, but then you're really not according to Islamic Sharia because she in the, basically had the whole house, and the kids did not inherit anything. Not necessarily, not necessarily. Um, you can have, you can give the surviving spouse the ability to live in the house um, while, having, while having multiple owners um, of the house. Right, so, so there's, that, there's that possibility of doing that. So say for example you have a house and it's deeded to multiple people, right? Um, and so the house is owned by this person, this person, this person. These are, so, so remember, we create a pie when we do inheritance. And then various pieces of the pie go to various individuals. And so various individuals can own that house. Now the problem, uh, the, the, the problem in doing it that way is, remember I talked about potential drama. You know, so you own, you own property with your son and your son has marital problems. It's like, now I'm worried about being, not being in my house anymore, right? Um, so, so there's that concern. And so, so some of that has to do with how you structure the, um, the inheritance to make sure that there is some, uh, there's some protection for the surviving spouse while at the same time not denying anybody their right to inheritance. Um, and so that's going to be a very individualized thing. So when you look at somebody's assets and you say, yeah, this would be the solution to that. Um, and, and one solution, a solution for one family might be different from a solution for another family. Um, but generally speaking, you can structure things so that the surviving spouse can have the ability to live in the family home. One of the, when, I, when I started doing this, I mean, I, I realized that this is going to be the biggest challenge with Islamic inheritance, is what to do about the surviving spouse and, and the surviving spouse's ability to live in the house. Now, there are going to be other situations as well where um, and there, you know, there might be some cautions to it. If you're going to have the surviving spouse manage a trust. So, say for example, my my the 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 story, the thing I was telling you about about the uh, shares of Apple Computer. And in that instance, the CEO of Apple would be the surviving spouse. And the surviving spouse is the person that can't be kicked out, um, can't be kicked out of the house. Well, what happens? In, what happens when the surviving spouse gets remarried? Well, what happens when we get remarried a lot of the times is that you don't, the dynamics between the couple, the husband and the wife might change. So if one person, and you know, in marital law, in, the, in, in divorce, they, they usually refer to things as the in-spouse and the out-spouse. So there's usually one spouse who knows, who knows about all the property and deals with all the checks and you know, knows everything, and there's another spouse who's completely clueless about everything. Um, and so you don't necessarily know which spouse is going to be, who's going to be what spouse in each individual marriage or who's just going to completely take charge. And it might be that 
um, a new spouse will come in and completely take charge and end up oppressing the other beneficiaries in some way or another. And so you want to be able to guard against that in your in your planning as well. Um, and so the planning could be could be one where you're going to where you're going to consider well what'll happen in the event you know it's going to be one situation and if this happens if there's a surviving spouse who hasn't been remarried but once re once remarriage happens then you trigger other circumstances that will that'll change the dynamics completely right okay what if there are two spouses what if a man is married to two wives or more than one wife? yeah so um, the the question was well what if a man is uh, is married to is married to two wives um, and uh, you know it's uh, it, it's something that uh, you'll have to develop an estate plan where you know you can give inheritance to two to two different wives it's uh, it's entirely it's entirely possible um, one one thing that I've uh, one thing that's happened in my case is that a lot a lot of the times they don't do that I mean a lot of guys I mean I have a number of I have a number of wives who do their estate plans and they want to make sure that their husbands are beneficiaries. Um, but uh, but I, I did have one situation actually just uh, a few weeks ago where I had an old client who uh, who met me at a who met me at a, at one of these Islamic uh, dinners and he said, "Oh, I have to come and see you again. I have three or four more kids." And I was like, "That's uh, that's I guess he had three kids." And I, I said, "Well, that's that's uh, that's great, mashallah. I mean, do you have any more wives?" And he's like, "No, I still have two. Uh, and so what, what he'll what he'll do is he'll he'll want to make sure that uh, you know it's going to be they're going to share the proportion of inheritance that's uh, that's due for that's due for the wife um, if he has uh, if he has um, houses for both of them um, he can do exactly the same thing that he did for one wife for two wives um, if he has the means to do so there is no there there are no problems in doing that so if he has two families he can do it for two families if he has it for three families he can do it for three families um, it's uh, it's completely possible to do that um, uh, you know what, what one thing I, one thing I will say though just as a caution just because you know this is probably on the internet it's a nullity I mean under 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 the, under state law a second marriage is a nullity um, and uh, and of course bigamy is a crime and so what typically people will do is they might get a, um, they can get a cohabitation agreement uh, with, multiple, with multiple wives um, if they want to, uh, or they can have some sort of a written agreement uh, with them and, uh, a, 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 and, and arrange, for their, um, arrange for their affairs outside of, um, outside of the family code or outside of, outside of the family uh, code process to the extent that that's possible to do. So, um, so if people want to arrange their, uh, their affairs in that way, they totally can do that. Yes, uh, not every small city has access to Islamic lawyers. What if in our will we say that our inheritance after we are deceased be divided according to Islamic law? Would that stand up in the court of law or not? Mm. Would they do it or not? Sure. Uh, the request came to people at the back cannot hear um, I'm happy to repeat the question. So um, many many places do not have an attorney who is versed in uh, Islamic rules of inheritance or is able to do is able to do that. Would it be okay to do um, the Islam? Uh, would it be okay to do uh, to write in your will? Let's say I want everything to be passed on based on the Sharia. Would that actually hold up? And the answer to that is is no. Um, judges are not equipped to interpret Sharia. Um, they, you need to be as specific as possible in your estate plan as to what it is that you want to do. Um, we, we obviously have a, we, we, we have a, we have the First Amendment. You have the ability to plan, uh, to plan your estate based on your own faith tradition. Um, however, courts are not going to, they're not going to go into the business of, uh, uh, of interpreting what is or what is not Sharia, there's uh, there's case law on that. I mean, people have tried doing it before. It just it just doesn't work. Um, so so don't bother. There in the back. So, I mean, uh, he passed away in a forgiving 
and that according to his will, all his wealth comes to the masjid. Uh, the guy who was back in Egypt, he said he had the right and inheritance. Uh, what would you say about that? Uh, that part of the so the brother said he has a right to inheritance? Yes. Okay, so the question here is that a masjid got, uh, there was a will, a man, a man who before he died, he did a will. Um, he didn't have a wife, he didn't have children. Um, go to islamicinheritance.com, I don't have a card on me, sorry. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> So, um, sorry about that. There are, um, there, so there are, there, there are two brothers, no wife, no children, and he leaves a will giving everything to the masjid. Now, the brother comes up and says, hey, I have a right to inheritance. What's the right thing here? Well, there are two questions. What's right and what's the law? Right? They're not the same thing. Um, and so, uh, he, in Islam, the brother absolutely has the right to inheritance. The masjid did not have the right to get all of his estate. That shouldn't happen. The family members have the right to inheritance. Um, and the masjid should not receive more than the one-third wasiyah. That, be that would be the right thing and that would be the, that would be the correct answer. Uh, um, of course, uh, in, uh, under, uh, under state law, if you write a will, and that's the, the testator's intent, is to give everything to the masjid, um, legally everything belongs to the masjid. And, uh, and the brother probably can't go to court and challenge it um, successfully either. Um, we have a question here. Um, what if you own properties in multiple countries? How do you handle the Islamic inheritance from the United States? If you have property in multiple countries, um, you will typically have to do things in multiple countries. Uh, so uh, for people who have assets, in uh, you know, in uh, say, I mean, there, 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 there are different countries with different laws. Many countries do not recognize such things as trusts. Um, other countries will recognize business entities. So what one one thing people may do often is that they might own subsidiary companies and have have those companies be owned by companies in the United States. Um, or in other place where they might do their, their estate plan and then have everything ba be, be distributed based on the Islamic rules of inheritance that way. Um, but, but normally if somebody has, say, property, you, just, you, know, you don't want to come up with a, with a complex structure like that. Um, and you know, it's just somebody who has a house in Pakistan or, or something along those lines. You're typically going to need to get a lawyer here in the United States and you're going to need a lawyer in, uh, in other countries um, in order to in, in order to deal with uh, in order to deal with that absolutely brother in the white shirt yeah you yeah yes so uh, the most common Islamic world template that's out there is the one by Isna is it sufficient to just fill that out have a bunch of people sign and put that away or do you need to register the will with your local municipality secondly. Uh, you mentioned that in many laws here, we see marriage as an economic partnership. Uh, Islamically, the man is responsible for the upkeep uh, of the family. But in a divorce, uh, many state laws divide property equally. So is it OK, then, as part of financial planning, to have a prenup that governs how uh, a divorce will take place, recognizing that the, man, the marriage was never an economic partnership? Okay, so there there were a couple of things in there. One was about the one was about the prenup. Um, I can answer that. But what was the the first one? Can you say that again? The, uh, it's not template. Yes. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, I, yeah, I got you. Okay, so um, one thing is the uh, there's a the, a question. The question has to do with well, is the isna template sufficient? Um, and the other question has to do with the prenuptial <laughs> agreement. Um, I um, as far as the isna template, I, I was until fairly recently, I was on. Uh, I was on Isna's board, uh, and I and I know that the, the uh, one of my predecessors had told me this before that uh, Isna Isna doesn't really have that will template anymore on their website. Um, I don't think I don't believe they actually 
Um, they actually uh, uh, they actually stand by that necessarily. Um, but but uh, you know who, somebody who's currently with us might be able to respond to that. Um, I, I don't uh, I don't believe that in most instances that would be. Um, that would be sufficient, and uh, and there, I, I, I have some personal problems with that document, um, but uh, but and that's all I would say with respect to the with respect to the template. Um, with respect to uh, the issue with the, with respect to prenuptial agreements, um, everybody know what a prenuptial agreement is. Has anybody heard that term before? Right, okay, so a prenuptial agreement basically is saying that um, I don't know if we're married yet. I mean, we're not married yet, so I don't know if we trust you, if I trust you, so why don't you sign this? And there's also a thing called a postnuptial agreement, which is now that we're married, I know that I don't trust you. <laughs> so, um, what a, what a prenuptial agreement, and what I was actually talking about a property agreement as between a husband and a wife. Um, under the laws of a lot of states, particularly like, say, my state, um, prenuptial agreements are considered to be presumptively coercive, um, meaning that the law is usually going to presume that one party, say, the wife, is like, yeah, sure, whatever, honey, I'll sign it. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, they don't necessarily know what they're getting into, so it's a very, it's a very paternalistic system. Um, that we have for prenuptial agreements. And so typically what happens when you do them is that both sides get lawyers. There's like a waiting period. Um, that, that depends on the state, of course. But yeah, there, usually you'll see like some sort of a waiting period. Um, and then uh, and you, have to, you have to hire a lawyer. Normally if I'm doing a prenuptial agreement um, and uh, I, I can't even refer um, another lawyer to the other side, they have to find their own lawyer. Um, and so it's a, it's a fairly lengthy process to, to do it. A lot of the times it doesn't, it doesn't even work. Um, but uh, it's a really good idea to do. If somebody says that, yeah, it's not an economic partnership, you have your stuff, I have my stuff, that's, that's, actually, that's actually fine. I have one elderly client who, um, who, had to, who, who, had, who was fairly wealthy and she, she got remarried and uh, the way she did it, she just did a kitab. She just did, she got remarried to the nikah um, and she has a cohabitation agreement. Um, similar, I mean, she, this isn't polygamous, this isn't completely monogamous, but she did a cohabitation agreement just because she didn't want it to be a threat to the older children. She didn't want to make, she didn't want the new marriage to be a threat and uh, she just did it based on, uh, she just said that, you know, I'm just going to do it this way. That's actually an option as well. There isn't anything written down in Islam that you have to get married under under state law, there are you know there are private agreements that you can make, um, it's called cohabitation agreements that are also possible that that uh, fall under a completely different legal standard than say um, say prenuptial agreements. Um, but prenuptial agreements is a good idea. It's very similar to say estate planning, where you want to make sure that everything is uh, you know in the event of divorce, um, you're not you're not going by whatever's in the family code. You're you're creating your own system of rules for how divorce is going to be done, um, because uh, divorce. Could be uh, could be an incredibly painful and difficult experience, and if you've already been divorced, um, there's a really good statistical possibility that you're going to get divorced again. Um, that just that, that's just that's just the way it is. And so most of the time, people who have been burned are usually going to want to get a prenuptial agreement um, beforehand, uh, and maybe it's worth considering not actually getting married under state law ever again. He asked another question that was about um, whether it needs to be notarized or filed somewhere in a So um, a last will and testament, the rule under virtually, uh, under virtually every single state um, is that you need two witnesses for a will. That's also an Islamic requirement as well. You need two witnesses for a will. A will does not need to be notarized. Um, with respect to um, anything that uh, an instrument, say like a living trust, a living trust is typically not notarized either, but by tradition it is, um, and there's a reason for it, because anything that has to do with real property will typically be notarized. Um, and so you're gonna normally see um, living trusts get notarized and last will and testament be signed with two witnesses. There's a brother right there in the blue. Uh, I have actually quite a few questions, but I'm gonna ask only one to give the turn to everyone. I mean, if you mentioned in the different scenarios that if someone has a daughter. So my question is, if I have only a daughter, okay, 
and my brother and sisters have some do they be part of Islamic inheritance? Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. So the question is, um, I only have a daughter, and then I have, um, and then I have uh, brothers. Uh, is there a father? I mean, like my siblings. Yeah, no, it depends. If there's, if your father is alive, then your brothers do not inherit. If your father is deceased, your brothers will probably get a little bit. So in the Quran, one daughter gets half. According to the Quran, a daughter gets half, uh, and then, uh, um, uh, and then uh, um, a wife gets. Um, a wife gets one eighth, uh, and uh, you know. So, but I, you know, obviously, I can't count. It's, uh, it's it might not be exactly. I mean, it's it might not be exact. I can't tell you exactly what your brothers are going to get, but they're probably going to inherit. Yes. <laughs> no, but I don't know the. Fra I can't do the math in my head. But yeah, that's right. They do get the rest. Do you have one that you can recommend and how to register? Online, Yeah, so I actually, I, I actually don't, uh, I don't, like, for the reason, the, the, the question is, is there an Islamic will that I can recommend? Um, okay, so uh, I actually, I, you know, I, I don't like, I, I, I don't like wills for a lot of reasons, but I do them for my presentations. Like I might give them away, um, and it might be useful for some people. Um, if you, if you do, if you text message four four two two two, and um, and uh, text message the word ikna mass, text ikna mass, ikna mass. Text message the word ICNA Mass, I C N A M A S, to 44222. There's my resource guide. It includes a it includes a template for a last will and testament. So um, so you can get that. You have to you'll have to calculate, and I have you know I have a link to the calculator as well. So you can calculate the specific shares of inheritance. Okay. Um, One last question, and then we're done because we're over we're out of time. time. Okay. Uh, my question is in regards to a lot of the examples that you gave uh, in terms of gifting and uh, you know giving like a future gift to try and tweak the distribution uh, that's established in, in uh, the laws of inheritance. Uh, you know when you gift something, you know it, it, you know you can uh, give whatever amount you you would like, but then uh, there's also ownership that's also um, you know transferred as well. Yes, it is. So, I mean, in Islamically speaking, you know, that, that has to be also given, you know, so in terms of these examples that you're giving about, like, you know, the spouse maintains, uh, you, know, you know, say, for example, the ownership of the house or state remains in the house and has, uh, you know, the, uh, the rights to uh, do with the property as, as she wishes or he wishes and, and so on. I mean, are we... Uh, how are we so let me can I can you can we can we just uh, uh, let me let me just correct that um, you said that uh, we're, we're doing something where the wife and the husband can do as she wishes with the property I'm not suggesting that for a minute no that's not true uh, and, and so what we would do is we'd arrange for we'd, we'd make some we'd make some family arrangements um, that uh, that allow for that allow for accommodation of, uh, of of the circumstances that a surviving spouse can find herself in or find himself in. Um, I, I I wouldn't also I wouldn't also characterize it as tweaking the shares of inheritance because you're not doing that when you're giving a gift the money is gone, right? So um, you're. You are you are giving up your property. It's a, it's a real it's a real substantive gift. If a gift were to be say illusory, um, I'll give you uh, I'll give you uh, you know a thousand dollars, but then I can take it back. You didn't really give anything. Um, in this instance, you're actually giving you're giving something of value to somebody else, um, which is which is of course traditionally what we regard uh, as being a gift. Um, and so so yeah, you're you are you are giving a gift, and it's not connected to death either. So, okay. Jazakallah khair. I'm, uh, th thank, you very, thank you very much. I hope this was of use and value to you. Alhamdulillah. Um, please do visit us on muslimmatters.org. Like, like us on Facebook. 